All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, once again, for those watching through the recording, um, welcome to the LGBTQIA plus alum panel. Um, we are joined by um, some of our uh, queer alum from Randolph College, as well as Randolph Making Women's College. Um, so for what we're gonna do is we're gonna, I'm gonna start off with a question. Um, so this question um, is, what was your experience like as a queer slash LGBTQIA plus student on campus? Um, and if, if you were out and if you weren't out, what was, why and what was your experience? All right, would, so I have a few names listed. Um, yeah, go ahead. Are you gonna call on us or should we jump in there? Just go ahead and jump in. Okay. And are we doing this according to the the questions we were given? Should we just answer those questions? Yeah, but if, if you feel up, if you want to um, answer another question as well, you feel free to do so. Oh, okay. Um, so my experience on campus was really mixed as a queer. Um, when I got there in 1984, it was a very, very different place than I understand it to be now. Um, it was, I think, a lot obviously harder to be queer and probably much harder for the people that were there before me. Um, one thing I remember really clearly is that we wanted to know who the people were that were queers there before us. And I don't know if you did this, Caroline, but we went through all these pictures up in Main Hall was being renovated when I was there. And up on the fifth floor, or whatever the floor is where all the furniture is, um, there was a room full of old pictures. And we went through and tried to figure out, mainly based on sports, who was queer and who wasn't. And then we, you know, it just uh, it, it gave us a sort of queer lineage. Um, you know, there was there was not a lot happening for queer students. We started the year that I was, I think I was a freshman. It might've been when I was a sophomore. We started a support group because you couldn't just have a group. It was a support group. And I don't know if you all that were there remember that um, really tall, narrow painting of the guy in main hall. It's to the left. You know that guy, I don't remember his name. But um, the way that we would let people know where the meetings were is we, I would myself tack a, um, a little note or tape a little note behind that painting. And if you pushed it to the side, you could see where the meeting was gonna be. And basically the meeting was me and my friends drinking beer. I mean, it was not any kind of anything else. But I think it was a way for people that were younger than us or newer at coming out than us to find a place where they, they might belong. And, you know, it, it was hard to be in a very sort of heterosexual identified environment, sort of over the top, cisgendered kind of whole world where the whole focus and you know those people that were there when I was or before I'm and probably after will identify with this. It was the whole focus was WNL, Hampton, Sydney and Pines parties and frat parties. And there was never like a moment in my life where I ever thought about that stuff at all. Never, I only went to Hampton, Sydney for a poetry thing that I went to when I was in college, but Otherwise, I never went to those colleges, never went to a frat party, but we did torture the guys at Pines parties. We would do all kinds of things to make their lives difficult. But um, it, I feel like it really pushed me towards my friends. We were visibly out, visibly queer, most of us. And I usually dated people who were not visibly queer. And they were usually not queer. They were people who were somewhere in the middle there, but who had no identification with queerness at all. And who were actually kind of scared of the whole thing, but who were into me or my friends for whatever reason. And 
So it created this weird place where you lived in two worlds. I lived out and happy in the world of my friends or in academia. But with dating, it was all on the DL. It was very, very, very different than it is now. And there was no, I didn't really have a concept of femme. So I just knew straight women who I dated that were not, you know, lesbians. It was, it was at the end of my, my time at randolph macon Women's College at the time that I, that I found a more specific niche that kind of made sense for me. But it did push me really close to my friends and very close to the professors that were supportive of us. A lot of professors really went out of their way to let me know and let friends of mine know that they were not homophobic and that they were you know, open to us and they were there for us if we needed help. And that mattered so much. Dr. Ray now was a big person in that way. Carolyn Bell, um, a million, you know, so many of those professors were great to us. Um, I don't think my queerness really affected my academic career. I really enjoyed school and I kind of thrived there talking about ideas with people, but it definitely made my connections to my friends much, much tighter. And we're all still friends today. You know, those are the people that, that I call if something good or bad happens. It's all those same people that were there. So that's, that's it for me. Thank you, Rob. Sure. Can I jump in? <laughs> yes. So it's, I, I was relating to a lot of what, what you were saying just now, and I guess because we're from the way back um, from 76. So, um, so my identity as a, a lesbian on campus was as, um, it wasn't just being out like to a few select friends or this or that. Um, I saw it as myself as part of a community and a movement, which was empowering and, and affirming to people and a rejection of the past where certainly there were people who were out to their friends or colleagues or whatever in, in the way back from the beginning, right? But um, uh, I think that from what I've been told, no one in 72, 73, 74 was out in that way, was bringing those things up. And just to put some historical perspective on it, when I came to Randolph-Macon in uh, 72, uh, it was just three years after the Stonewall riots. Uh, Gloria Steinem had just published the first uh, copy of Ms. Magazine, and Richard Nixon was still in the White House and was about to be reelected. So, um, so I just had some little notes here. So this uh, the second wave of feminism had taken off, but Randolph Macon didn't even have a feminist organization on campus, much less an LGBTQ group. We had they called themselves the Young Democrats Club and the Young Republicans Club. That was it for political anything. Um, certainly no LGBTQ then. Um, so support and recognition for queer students then was non-existent. And my first year, I came out to a friend who was then president of the Skeller. Does that still exist? The Skeller? <laughs> That's a thing? Anybody <laughs> recognize that? It was like an eatery kind of, yeah, downstairs in the main hall. And uh, anyway, so the next day she promptly fired me from my job at the Skeller saying, she was totally serious, people won't eat any burger or omelet you've touched. Wow. She really said that. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> anyway, um, that wouldn't be my first, or, um, well, actually it was my first, but not my last experience with homophobia and job discrimination. Um, but as Rob was just saying, um, if other LGBTQ people existed at RM, there was no visibility. We were invisible to each other. So my sophomore year, a friend who was an ally helped me create these um, out of the closet posters and we hung them all over main hall late one night. And um, you know, they just sort of said different things. And uh, it was a way of saying we're here or I'm here. <laughs> and it caused an amusing stir on campus the next day. But anyway, uh, soon after that, a small group of uh, feminist students and myself started the Women's Coalition. And again, the administration gave no support, but there was a new school chaplain, some of you might remember, Katie Finney, who um, later assisted us in organizing a panel 
uh, on lesbian feminism uh, following a concert on campus. We'd had uh, Meg Christian who helped start Olivia uh, Records and so forth. And we were able to get a lot of different, you know, with Katie's help uh, back in us and a few others. Uh, we got Mary Daly, author of Beyond God the Father, Meg Christian and Jenny Beerson, Holly Near, you know, just to name a few. And um, there was also, this was, Kind of interesting about the history there was a women's studies course offered that year uh, run by i think about six dedicated volunteer professors from different departments none were paid it's a women's college and none were paid the course was extremely popular and uh, so there was a waiting list to get in which was capped i think around 60 students somewhere around there and so the Women's Coalition wrote a letter to the Sundial petitioning the administration to get these professors paid. Uh, eventually they did um, pay the course chair, that's all they would do. So the professors would rotate that chair monthly so they got paid. And um, one other interesting fact for you. Um, anyway, uh, I, I believe, and I agree with what you were saying before, um, that many students over the years would have been helped, uh, would have been far more successful at Randolph-Macon academically and otherwise if they'd felt it was safe to be open and honest uh, about who they were and feel supported because it was frustrating uh, emo and emotionally unhealthy, I think, for the students, the isolation. Uh, I'm grateful to those friends and professors uh, and a few staff members who were supportive during my years there, even when we didn't see eye to eye. Um, for example, during the senior art major exhibit, one of my paintings titled Self-Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man was removed by the administration and it caused quite an uproar, making the headlines in that week's sundial and oh, many, many students wrote letters to the editor uh, protesting the removal and uh, most of the students objected uh, on the basis that it was patronizing and they felt against the principles of scholarly debate, one of them said, uh, to have a work of art censored while on campus. That was what it was like <laughs> back in the bad old days. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's, thank you for sharing that, that information. I think that that's something that's really important. And I mean, um, this kind of, and, you know, this kind of helps us lead into our, our next question, which um, Jenny, I'll have you uh, have you start off. Um, but, you know, just the ex these experiences and learning about these histories and, and actually um, taking them down and talking about them and stuff like that. I think that impacts the ways in which students know how to navigate. You know, knowing about these things is um, is definitely helpful for that for queer students who are trying to figure out this and that and how to get um, the things that they need and stuff like that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Jenny, I'm going to I'm going to pitch it to you because you're going to kind of bring us from this question to our next question. But um, yeah, what was your experience um, being queer on campus? Um, um, were you out if you weren't? Well, you said you were. So um, how was that? Um, how did that impact you and moving on? Um, how how was that? How did that navigation um, impact you once you graduated and started working in your professional field? Yeah, uh, so I graduated in 2006. Um, I would say by my, my time on campus, um, there were a lot of people that were out. Um, I didn't come out myself till my senior year. I think for me, it was more, I didn't have a lot of role models before I entered college or knew of a lot of other people who were out before I hit college. So I didn't really have a lot of time to work through a lot of things about myself. And I wasn't ever in a place of being confident of just being out and single. Um, so it wasn't until I met Heather that I really started to dive deeper into like wanting to be out and kind of embracing that self for me um, in my senior year. But I do remember there were there were a lot of people that were out. It was very accepting as far as I remember. Uh, I received a lot of acceptance from my friends and from my teammates, um, people that were in my networks at school. Um, there was a GSA, but it was, what's that bridges called bridges um but it was not very popular within the queer community i would say it was very small and very niche number of people who actually participated in it there were a large number of people who were 
out that were not part of it. Um, I think a lot of the people that I knew, we just kind of did our own things in our own networks. We didn't really feel that that organization as it existed at the time was something that we needed. It was more just figuring things out on our own. Um, so I would say I gained a lot in confidence towards my senior year and as I graduated. And I think having that extra confidence into myself led into the professional workforce for me. Um, I was very comfortable being out in all of my jobs post college. That may have been very naive of me. It might have, it comes down to probably my privilege and my confidence in knowing that as a feminine woman, that I may not be judged as harshly as other people in the community who didn't present as femininely as me. Um, so I was very comfortable being out. It was very important for me to make it known to my colleagues that I was in an LGBT relationship. Um, because I felt like that was important part of me and I didn't want to hide who I was in the workforce. So I just put myself out there from the start and I didn't really face a lot of pushback. Um, leading into like a further professional field, um, I'm now a wedding photographer that I've been in business about 10 years and I actually focus a lot. I serve a lot of clients in the LGBT community. Um, a lot of my branding, a lot of my personal story, a lot of my relationship with Heather and kind of the things that we have been through. Um, has really shaped my desire to be um, to be an advocate, to be someone who sees queer relationships, who sees the beauty in them, and who really wants to to show that to the world, to show other people who maybe aren't as familiar with queer people um, what what love and relationship looks like at all levels. And so that's a very big part of of who I am and who my my career is, where I've taken my career and, and what I project into the world on the public space. Um, and a lot of that comes from the confidence I gained at Macon. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, uh, Caroline, would you like to say a few things about um, how was it navigating life once you graduated and um, navigating your professional career? So uh, it, it, I, I was thinking back to what Rob was saying. And someone told me years later that the Friday evening bar club in Smith, in the basement of Smith, everyone was gay. And I was like, really? <laughs> All those people? So I'm, I'm fairly clueless when it comes to certain things. And I was like, really? All those people? Like, and then I was like, eh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I do think that one of the things is that because... I, I would give, so I might, I've made my career in academia. So that's, so in some ways I've always been in a fairly safe space in terms of being a faculty member or in terms of being an administrator now. Um, I, I think that those, that sort of approach was formed so much by my, ex, by my four years in Lynchburg and at the college. Um, because in some ways I was taught how to just sort of be me because people didn't, I didn't necessarily have to announce anything, but on the other hand, I didn't have to make a lot of assumptions either. And so I just sort of moved through that space. And one of the things that became interesting when I became a faculty member was um, that when I would see students and, and I, I laugh and I say that it, at some point all female faculty, maybe men too, but certainly female faculty have that moment when you become sort of parent. And you're, you become the safe person to sort of try things out on. And I definitely think that my responses to students as they began to explore their own sexuality in my classes um, and, and in my office through office hours and, and advisees really was sort of grounded in that sort of sense of acceptance that I had because many of my friends accepted me. I mean, there was never any big deal about it. Nothing, there was, there was, I never had the sense that a big deal was being made of it. Um, and I was able to sort of bring that to the table and sort of go, yeah, I remember being this age and being, you know, sort of trying to figure this out. And there obviously an age gap between me and the students, but, and I think that the times have changed so much that now, when I look at the students now, now I'm in New Orleans, so it's a fairly flamboyant group, no matter what. Um, but, you know, that people really are sort of able to own it in a way that, in all honesty, I'm not sure I would have really been comfortable owning it then at 18 or 20. 
just as I'm not necessarily comfortable of owning it that way now for me, because that's just not who I am. But um, I, I think it definitely, if I had had some traumatic experience, I think it would have formed me. The lack of that trauma and the fact that I was able to move through worlds without too much hassle or really any hassle, and it was just sort of, that's just Caroline, um, I think makes a big difference in terms of how you approach the world. So I've never, when I left, I never really thought of it being that big of a deal. And I, I owe that a lot, of, I think, to the, to the community and that place of being safe and of trying to sort of explore it. Um, I, I give a lot of credit. Thank you for thank you for sharing. And I, I think too is you know you talked a little bit about the ways in which um, you know you know student people who are student age now you know they they you, they seem to be more comfortable in having these big convers these conversations that were you know not supposed to be had or kind of you're mm -hmm. back in the background um, you know these conversations are being had these. Um, you know, no, 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 my pronouns are, you know, when, you know, that's something that you wouldn't have necessarily seen. Um, and I think that, you know, in this next question, I'm, I think that this um, has some impact in that. Um, but I'm going to um, turn to, to, to Heather on this one. Um, how have shifts in national policies on equal rights for the queer LGBTQIA plus community impacted you? Yeah, thank you. Before I jump into that, though, uh, kind of going off of what Caroline said, I definitely was one of those people who walked on campus and everyone was like, oh, you're gay? Okay. And I was like, what? No, I'm not. And then that became the big joke when I came out sophomore year. Everyone was like, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I was the opposite. Nobody assumed I was gay. They were like, really? Really? Yeah. We came out together and people were like, well, Heather, that makes sense. But Jenny? no way it's like okay okay anyway um as far as national policies go she's gonna tell stories too um the big one for us really was probably marriage equality so we graduated from Macon Jenny's kind of stuck around a couple years in Lynchburg until I graduated and we ended up in the DC area um got engaged while we were up there and then sort of started planning this weird like okay should we get married in one of these like three states where it's legal what should we do how should we navigate this where should we have a ceremony um so we were gonna go to like where Massachusetts, Connecticut, Connecticut somewhere we have no tie to that region but we were like I guess like do people just wear like boat shoes up there like where would we get married I don't know um and then while we were living in the area, marriage equality passed in D.C. And so we ended up with just like six of our friends taking the metro into the courthouse one day in 2010 and getting married in June. Um, and we had planned this big ceremony out in California for September of 2010. And unfortunately, um, Prop 8 passed while we were planning our wedding. So it went from being legal to no longer legal, which was a weird experience. Um, so we had a legal ceremony in June of 2010, and then basically a big party fake ceremony in September of 2010. And then we moved to New York and we were no longer married until marriage equality passed in New York. And then we moved to Colorado and we were no longer married in 2012. Um, we had to get, Sorry, we had to get uh, a domestic partnership notarized at the bank for her to get my benefits at work. And it was just this moment of like, is this for real? Like, I have to get this bank teller to notarize our relationship when I was married before we crossed state lines. So that was pretty wild. But then um, civil unions passed in Colorado in 2014. I think so, yeah. And then marriage equality passed nationally. So that was an interesting experience. And as I navigate my profession, which has mostly been queer related work, LGBTQ related work, it's a story that I share with young people to just kind of describe how like you can lose rights, you can lose access. And especially like as a non-binary person, like trans and non-binary people are not protected in every state. 
So just how that can look when you move from state to state. Um, another piece is that Jenny had to adopt our son that I gave birth to, even though she was on the birth certificate, um, because she didn't technically have legal rights to him if something were to happen. So there's interesting sort of shifts and we weren't sure how that was going to go in our semi-conservative rural area, but the magistrate was very inclusive and welcoming of our adoption. She could have not signed off on it, um, but that's been a shift for us too. That's been important to see. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, Tiffany, would you like to, to chime in here? So first, let me say thanks to everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so as I'm listening to everybody and I will do my best and I'm looking at Carolyn because I'm like, I'm doing my best to not go into um, PhD mode. So <laughs> because the one thing that I'm hearing from a lot of everybody else that has spoken, and I'm not going to do the for lack of better words, oppression Olympics. But for me as a black queer woman, like, let's just get real. <laughs> as a black queer woman, you know, it, I, I don't get that visibility. I don't get that, okay, well, you know, I can kind of sashay this way. You know, I mean, being black is hard enough. We're not just talking about today. We're talking about in general, we're talking about 400 years and then some. Okay, so let me just start there and breathe. Husa. So there is that. Then to be black and queer and to be in a black community, by the way, um, FYI, my family does live in Lynchburg, but we will not talk about that. So to be black and queer, living in Lynchburg during the time of the original, the OG Jerry Falwell, I'm looking at Melissa because we were known as the whores on the hill. We'll just say it that way. That's what we were. But then for me, as a Black queer woman, and I'm going to say this, Bridges was not inclusive. Brid from my experience, Bridges was not inclusive because everybody who was in Bridges was white, like looked butch, or so you couldn't be stud, look butch. You couldn't be femme. And FYI, the only reason I did this is because I got lipstick on right now. Okay, so I just put the lipstick on. Any other time, if you see me on the weekend and I'm coaching, trust me, my wife has put away my cargo shorts. She's like, you can't wear these cargo shorts out in public, for the record. And my wife is definitely more stud than me, 100%. So you had to, you had to fit this part. So being at Macon from 1997 to 2001, you had to look a certain part. And if you didn't wear a dress, you were automatically put as queer. And then I always felt bad for my bisexual siblings because they got the raft. And it was like, oh, you're bisexual? Why can't you make a decision? I'm looking at you, Melissa, right? It was like, why can't you make a decision? So to be all of these things, and then to be like, oh, well, you're black. And then I remember somebody saying to me, once and I had already cut my had already come out my roommate from college Bridget O'Leary who we are still friends with to I I am still friends with to the same in fact she signed our wedding certificate um I I came out to Bridget and somebody from Bridget said to me um well how do you know that you're a lesbian because you haven't slept with anybody so and then that same person used to get upset with me when I'd be like, hey, so-and-so, when I would say something to her girlfriend. So, so we're gonna like, let that be there. We're gonna shelve that there. So to be black and to be queer, to be visibly a person of color, to be, for me to actually talk about race, and to talk about, I was like, well, where are my role models? Because in 1997, even though they were out there, like Langston Hughes, we'll start there. Like Audrey Lord, we'll start there. Like, I'm not going to continue, you know, everybody else, you got Google for you. So that was not what we were talking about in the women's studies classes or now gender studies classes or what have you. That, you know, it's like, I need you to bring in me, bring to me more than just bell hooks, even though intersectionality was co coined in 1989, but I will leave that there. So trust me, I had all my, my notes right here. So it was like you were either in bridges or you played rugby. 
Now, yes. So I played rugby one game. I played, I was on a tennis team and on the swim team. Let me tell you, I played rugby one game and I said, nada. No. And I caught the ball and I was like, what do I do with this ball? I did not know what to do with it. Yes. And you played softball too. Yes. But I was like, I don't know what to do. And they were like, run Tiffany. I was like, oh God. No, I swim. So anyway, so you had to do one or the other. Softball, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, you played softball. But it was like, it was the pressure to present. The pressure, like how you showed up. So having like, there was this, there was never really the conversation of national policies at that point, because we were still thinking about how am I going to be seen? How am I being seen what are my rights? How am I going to be seen politically? How am I be going to be seen in actual literature? And even though the literature was there, and this is the unfortunate part, and this is not me saying my experience at Macon was terrible for the record. I very much value, very much value my experience at Macon. I was a go hard for Macon girl, okay? But I will tell you the misstep was I always wanted more. Like I wanted, I wanted to read more than just bell hooks because that was, bell hooks was it. I was like, there has to be more than this. There has to be more than Toni Morrison. There has to be more than Alice Walker. There has, but why is it this being implemented into our curriculum? Now I can say that with these three little letters behind my name as I look at Carolyn, you know, now I can say this. But, you know, it's the pressure to, to present. So as far as national policies, like being, being married now, I can say is a privilege. Being married is a privilege. I will tell you, and I, I've never shared this story and I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll be quiet. But when I was at American University, I took a semester and a summer off, went to the uh, Washington semester program in 2000. Fall, uh, spring of 2000 and summer of 2000. And uh, my mom had passed away in 99, in the fall of 99. My dad sent a letter to me saying to me that you need to come back to Jesus. And see, my, even my turtle is upset right now. You need to come back to Jesus. And I know a place for you to do that. You need to register with Exodus. So he wanted me to go through gay conversion therapy. And mind you, I didn't go, didn't go. Um, but I always, I remember saying to my dad, you know, I really, really want you, like, why don't you wear like a ribbon or why don't you go to like a, 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 a parent meeting, you know, a P flag meeting. Was like, my dad was like, no, now, mind you, my father was the chairman of the Republican party in Portsmouth, Virginia. I am not gonna say his last name because it's my last name. But my dad was very, very active. And to this day, he's very much against the LGBTQ plus people, my siblings. And, and so understand like gay conversion therapy was a thing um, at that particular time. Jerry Falwell was reigning. So the idea of national policies and equal rights, like have I been able to do things? Yes. Again, but being married is a privilege. I am definitely more seen on the, okay, how are my trans siblings doing? Mm. How are my black trans, let me, let me rephrase that. How are my black trans siblings doing? Because people were not looking out for me and they sure as hell ain't looking out, excuse me, for my siblings, my black trans siblings. So I think that's really, excuse me, but no, but really that's really what I want. That's where I want the paradigm shift to be. Everybody was really excited about HRC when, when, when we were at Macon, like when, when I was at Macon, it was like, Oh, look, look at the equal sign. I was like, y'all know it's run by a bunch of white people and white men who have money, right? Like real talk, yes. And yes, the president was black and yes, he's now out and whatever. But understand, you have to understand the history of that. HRC was not inclusive. HRC was not inclusive of trans issues. They were not inclusive of black issues. They were not inclusive of if you were black and poor and you were queer, forget that. 
So the history of LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus and how it's impacted me, again, going back to how it has impacted me, was the fact that I wasn't seen. Everybody loved Ellen. Everybody was like, oh, excited about, no, don't get me wrong, I was excited about Ellen. But people did not understand the fact that there were people before Ellen that, you know, like, they, they just did not, they, they didn't want to talk about that. They didn't want to, you know, it's like, there, there are people that look like me that are all variations of brown and then some that are part of the LGBTQ plus people, you know, humans, like, you know, so I think, again, going back national policies, did it impact me? Of course. But I think, you know, again, for me personally, it was for a little bit of time, I had the fear of my dad actually coming in, withdrawing me from school because my dad had actually kicked me out of the house and I didn't have a way to pay for my senior year. And I, that was when I, I personally became afraid of picking up the phone and I was like, oh wait, who's calling me? Oh, it's financial aid. Somehow, some way money appeared. You know, so I think that's the privilege of being surrounded by particularly at that time, white women who did not have that fear, you know, to be black and queer and then to have no money and to be kicked out of your house. Like, it's not a sob story. It's not like, oh, like it's a lifetime movie or I'm going to be interviewed by Oprah. I wish I was interviewed by Oprah, but I mean, that was my, that was my story. And then it became this, well, my story is this, well, my story is this. Then, and I was like, yo, like, are we really going to sit here and like combat, like have this battle of who got kicked out of the who's house? Like, you know, and that's what it became. So, I mean, again, I think that's the only, I, that's the one critique that I have about my experience mm -hmm. was that as much as we said, inclusion, 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 it really wasn't inclusive. If you were going to be black and you're a woman, you had to be straight. You had to be Christian or you had to follow this particular way of life. And I don't think people really thought about that. I think people just kind of was like, oh, well, she's confused. It's okay if you're white and you can be queer because Ellen's queer. But if you're black, ciao, please. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Rob, if you want to go ahead and, and chime in really quickly. I really, really appreciated what you just shared, Tiffany. I, I wanted to also add, you know, I tried to sort of stay on topic with that question, but there's a lot more obviously to say about this. And a, a lot of what you said really resonated with me. One thing I want people that are younger and people that are there now in any capacity to be aware of is that when we were in college in the early 80s and the mid 80s, if you were queer, visible or not, if you were black, brown, anything, any other you know, skin tone besides pearly white and big if you were a foreign student, you lived in one dorm almost exclusively. There were very, very few. In fact, I can count three black women who did not live in that dorm. And I mean, I think pretty much everyone there at the time identified as a woman, which is why I say that, but those three black women definitely did. And you, know, you were other for sure. And unless you were unless you really made an effort to blend in, which obviously you can't if you are not white, then you were put in that dorm. And how did it happen magically? I do not know, but it did. And so it became a thing. And also we all ate at almost, almost all of us, foreign students, black students, not all black students, but nearly all, and all out queers ate at this one table in the dining room, you know, that we called Fred. We, we all ate there and, you know, it, it really um, resonated for me to hear you talk about that because 
you know, the HRC, I would never have the HRC symbol on my car or on anything. I loathed them for their lack of inclusivity. And, and it was a lot around race, I have to say. The other thing I wanted to add is that there was no parsing out for me queerness from my, my political self. The personal is and was for me very, very political. And it, you know, my queerness was wrapped around, you know, feminism was wrapped around the nuclear proliferation problem and the no nuke zone situation. It was wrapped around all kinds of things we were involved in in those years of Reagan and Bush. And it was, it was just something you couldn't take apart for me my queerness from politics. And I find that that has carried me through. And that kind of finding your voice, like a lot of people do in a single sex environment, you know, I found a completely different voice for myself that let me as, you know, a masculine appearing female bodied person go into the work world in, you know, men's attire, shoes, men's haircut, whatever. And, and be okay. I, that would not have been true if I had been black during that time. I really find it hard to believe that if I had been a brown skinned person of any, any, I would not have been able to take that. So it really is about privilege, no matter what you know, era you're talking about. And it still is now, I think. It's so great to look across here and see people of color. I have to tell you, it is so, so good. So I just wanted to get that out. Rob, I just want to tell you, I can feel your eyes just saying, I got something to say. I, I just wanted to let you know, I could feel it through the Zoom screen, okay? I could feel it, honey, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you all. For, thank you for sharing. And um, I think this, you know, um, this kind of goes to, to show all of the, you know, it's it's so much larger. I mean, it's an it's an acronym for God's sake. I mean, there's it's so much larger than just that one experience, and those different experiences impact people in a, in completely different ways. And I think the important part of that is acknowledging and being inclusive and being visible and having those things. And um, I want to now, you know, I want to hear from um, I would like to hear from Daquan um, a little bit more about you know how that how those things and how those struggles and how um, these ideas impacted you as, um, you know, a student after um, Randolph-Macon being um, a queer um, gay Black man, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Avery. I'm going to echo uh, Dr. Quash. I would hate to, to I don't want to be on the list, but um, I, I want to also say that as a man, I have privileges identifying as a male and being presenting as a male. So my experiences with my gender and the privileges there, I wanna put that out there first before I talk about the level of being multi-oppressed. Um, being a black man, I want us to understand that the historical stereotypes, archetypes that are associated with black masculinity and how the performance is supposed to go, especially in the media. I obviously from my vocal tonality, I am not deep based. I don't, I don't have a deep voice where I'm like, yeah, what's up, bruh? That's not really uh, what I do. Um, I've talked the same way I've been um, since I was like in middle school. And my first level of understanding the inter the intersections, I want to say intersectionality because of how it implies, however, it is not the way the terminology is structured. I want to put that out there as well. As an academic, I want to also, you know, give some courtesy. But the intersections of my race, my sexuality, and my gender were very apparent to me in middle school in the way I was supposed to dress and speak and act. And then getting to college and being out before I hit the, hit the doors, going through your teenage years of being out was very traumatic for me, especially in middle school with being bullied. And then going to a liberal arts private high school, I did not have any representation through the staff or through friends who are black queer men. So a lot of what my experiences were in Red Off was um, not making my own space or creating my own space, but 
making myself feel comfortable where I landed and pushing the level of access for myself a lot of times. Um, so that was very difficult, especially as a black man, you're supposed to present a certain way. So for the rest of my black, um, black male peers, I was not representative of them. They did not want me to be the representative. They were not conducive to that. And so I, at an early age, had to be comfortable with homophobia from black, uh, black community and then the racism within the queer community. And that impacts a lot of how you see yourself in academia, especially with the levels of rejection. Though my family is supportive, I've been very, I always say that I'm very privileged to have a family that supports me from the gate. Um, from my mother and father down to my grandparents, my late grandfather and my grandmother. Like they've been all very supportive of me and my level of existence. To having friends on campus, both um, black and non-black who are supportive of my identity and, and my level of experiences. But it, the presentation of masculinity for me, even now, is very difficult in the way that I dress, speak, um, the way I go into um, jobs. And I've had the privilege of this past summer being a fellow for the governor's office. And I am a homo. That's not going to change. That's what I'm going to be. Um, and I have gotten the chance to be, to rechange my wardrobe and find out what works for me, what I'm comfortable with, what I like to wear and showing up in um, heels to work and then loafers and normal dog, like Oxford shoe, little shoes the next day confused a lot of the administration there. They were very lost at that. I even this past this past summer, 2021, was at a bill signing and the one of the communications workers, she no longer works there. So let me say that. So don't go look her up now. But uh she like up down me with her nastiest look of the fact that I like had heels on, my nails was painted. And so I've had to learn how to be comfortable with myself and support myself, much like the rest of us, but being a black man in the world, you just like black women who are queer, you need to present a certain way to get that support and your lack of presenting, especially for black, black men, the slightest ounce of effeminacy or flamboyant actions or personality has you ridiculed from your racial group and your sexual group as well. You, I'm deemed less of a man consistently because my nails are painted or my bracelets or I got a blouse on or a t-shirt or I'm like, you know, there's so many things that go along with that. And that's kind of um, how my experiences were at Randolph, especially with not go going in and not seeing any black queer men who were um, quote unquote prominent on like leadership organizations or things like that. And then being a first year class president, a student government president, um, working with the, being in ADA, and so there's so many things I was involved in that caused me to be in the public line, the public eye on campus. And that kind of resulted in a, a more a level of pushback from men, whether they were black or not. But because of my personality and people revering me, I was able to access a level of social support and social capital that a lot of my peers who were queer and black did not get access to. Thank you for for that. Um, but before before we continue on, like I, I want, um, it's it's seven fifty nine. So um, I just want to say that. Um, but we we will keep going with whoever decides to to remain as well. Um, because there are some. There's one more question, and then um, I want to give people the chance to um, ask a question if they have one. Um, but I think something that's really important from what Daquan said is, you know, I, you know, me being, you know, queer and me being um, biracial, um, you know, I felt that, you know, I felt that kind of pull, but at the same time you have, you know, people on campus like Daquan, sorry, 
um, who had that public life, you know, and so I could see myself even even in Daquan just being class president and not a you know a faculty member or a staff member. That was something that kind of helped me too. And so um, the right before right before we go into the last question, um, I wanted to just ask the panel um, if they have um, any advice or any anything to say to a student who may be watching. Um, who may be going through these struggles, may be trying to find themselves in a space, but you know, either clashing with um, different intersecting identities that they have, um, or anything like that. What are some What is some advice that you would give um, to those students, as well as um, anybody who may be experiencing this in a professional realm? You know, you, I mean, coming out is not a young phenomenon, <laughs> so. Um, you know, how, what are some, what's some, what's some, some advice that you would have give, would you give? I'm going to quickly just drop this. Um, be kind to yourself. And that sounds, that's so cliche to say, but in my journey with my sexuality, learning that everything is being queer or gay or wherever you fall on that spectrum is not finite. You don't have to decide today or tomorrow or the next year and learning, being comfortable with figuring it out. And I think that is the, the most beneficial thing I can say is just being comfortable with the I don't know as of right now and to figure it out as you go along because things change every day. There is no shame in the therapy game and you can like say it's for me, okay? There is no shame in the therapy game. I will tell you now, I did a lot of research with the therapist I have currently. I love her. Um, I had criteria, had to be a Black woman and understood LGBTQ plus issues. And then on top, like I had criteria. It was like I needed to date myself. Um, but yeah, I think I, I did not have, I had a therapist while I was at Macon. It was not the best situation for me at that particular time. So I would say definitely like there is no shame in the therapy game. Um, yeah, I, I would just say really quickly, and, and this is about anything to young people, is I promise you it gets better. Hang in there, take care of yourself, be kind to yourself. I think one of you all said that. And yeah, therapy helps <laughs> just, just for the support, but it, it, it really does get better. Just hang in there. I would add that, you know, no matter where you are or what your support network's like or what kinds of struggles you have in terms of your identity and how you present and what people know or don't know about you by looking at you. I think the key is to try to do some combination of allowing yourself to envision possibility and finding a person or a couple of people or ideally a group of people that accept you even in a state of not knowing what's going on with you, that just accept you, that's start there with you, a place you can talk, a place you can wonder out loud without being judged. If you can find one person that you can do that with, it could be your grandmother, it could be a straight friend, it could be a therapist, it could be somebody that you really identify with for whatever reason. You know, it could come in an unexpected place, but finding that person that lets you just be who you are, I think makes a big difference in terms of not being alone. And I would add one more thing to that, which is, um, I think you, I think it is important to remember to be patient with those who you love. That um, I, I remember years ago, and and the the, the realization that that you opening the cl the closet door can cause a closet door to shut on someone else, and it's going to take them a while to sort of get used to who, you, they have to go through the same process in some ways that we have to with their friends and their families and all of that. And so to yes, be you and be authentically you, um, but also allow other people 
to be authentically themselves as they work their way through some of this, especially if you come from a culture where this is not something which is going to be celebrated, um, that you have to give people that same sort of grace of allowing them to struggle with it and, you know, again, be, be, let them be them and let them, let them find their own way. Cause they're going to have to do that also. I think that makes a big difference, especially with family who in some cases really do care in some cases who don't, but still don't necessarily know how to present it to others. Um, it, you know, that that's, it, it, it takes a while, you know, for, for them me saying I'm getting married is very different than my father saying to his people, my daughter's getting married to Susan. Um, and that, you know, you, you have to have some grace around that just as, as you would want for that grace to be given to you. I think I would also add sort of on the flip side of that, if there are people in your life who can't come on board, who can't, support you, that you can survive without them. Um, you know, as someone who was excommunicated from my church community at 19, had parents who did not accept me, I have been able to move forward in life and build new community and new networks. And it will still hurt at times, but you can survive in the world as your authentic self. So I think it's kind of a both and with that piece. Thank you everybody for sharing and giving such great advice. Um, I, I wanna um, wrap up with um, asking if um, our panelists have any resources that they would like to share with students um, who may be queer or um, you know, queer, black, queer, person of color, um, any resources that you think that, they, that would be beneficial for them um, you can either do kind of a quick plug or you can send something in the chat, um, but I'm also going to ask or um, either me, Lauren, or somebody's going to ask um, for you to share that material so we can send it out um, as well. So if you want to do a quick plug or you wanted to type something in the chat. If anybody is, if, if you're a student and you're looking at graduate schools, um, my recommendation is to definitely look at what support is available. I know at the graduate school level, I know it's not a very specific thing, but that was something that I found to be very helpful when I was doing, particularly when I was doing my PhD in the middle of nowhere, i.e. Indiana. So, um, so I mean, as, as a doc student to be able to say, oh, there's an LGBTQ plus center and oh, now the LGBTQ plus center director is a black queer man. And you know, now I'm on the alumni association for LGBTQ plus at Indiana, you know? And so to be able to be that instrumental role, it's like, okay, now I can be able to give back. Yes, I would love to give back for the alumni association for make it or for Randolph College for the record. Um, <laughs> um, physic, my physical being and my knowledge, not necessarily monetarily just yet. Um, but I mean, but I think that's really important to definitely look into what what the graduate school is able to offer. If it's like, hey, there's a writing hour, or hey, let's just grab drinks or let's have game night or something like that. I think those are things that are really helpful, particularly if you're going to be moving on to another institution, not just yet, but afterwards, you know. I want to quickly add on to um, Tiffany's statement. There's a, something called campusprideindex.org that is very helpful to type in the schools, the states in, in America as so where you want to apply to to figure out the best, their ranking from one to five on how they deal with issues for LGBTQIA people. I wish somebody had told me that, <laughs> but I wouldn't have met my wife. So, hey, it came out in the middle of it. <laughs> there is a, um, and I don't know what it is. There is a list of um, LGBTQ plus therapists I'm looking at Daquan. I don't know if you know what that list is. A friend of mine sent me that list. So maybe I can send it to Bethany or Avery, unless Daquan knows it off the top of it, you know, because you, you trust me way too much. I don't. <laughs> 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 yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> mm. 
any any other plugs or any resources? All right. Um, uh, I would just like to say uh, one, well, two, maybe three things. Um, <laughs> um, yes, one, please do send those resources. If you think of any, even after, um, do email us. You can do it, you know, email to diversity at Randolph College. Um, that would be great. Uh, so that we, we can keep a running list of any resources that we can offer to students that's really important that we start to build those resources. Um, that index is something that we started looking into a few months ago, Daquan, and so we um, intend to definitely, um, you know, do what is required um, for us, um, for Randolph College. Um, as well to make sure that we are um, on that index and that we are um, scoring appropriately <laughs> on that index as well. Um, then the last thing that I just have to say is that I really appreciate all of you sharing uh, yourselves this evening and your insights, your wisdom, your experiences, the history. Um, I learned a lot. Um, and I think that that is, you know, it's just incredible just to hear the, the various, um, you know, I think perspectives and, um, you know, ways that you all engaged uh, in the community, but also just, you know, what has impacted you. And um, I think that that's gonna speak to a lot of our students currently. A lot of this, you know, the stories are similar. And um, you know, people are still looking for a place and a space um, to, to give and to have voice. And so we are hoping that our office, which is central on campus and becomes that space where they know that they will not be judged. There is no judgment um, and they can completely be themselves. And not only that, but also to be supported. Um, and so, you know, and I'm really proud of Avery for stepping up in a lot of ways and um, you know, for being on purpose about what happens next and asking what's next. Thank you, Ms. Keisha. And um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we are going to wrap here. Um, once again, it was lovely seeing you all and meeting everyone. Um, if you, if for our attendees, um, if you have any questions um, about our panelists or you're um, wanting to connect with our panelists, um, please reach out to me or to Lauren Grimmett um, and we can work on that. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you all. Um, I hope you all have a lovely rest of your evening and thank you for joining us.